Well, good morning again. My name is Leandro Nogueira. I'm the lead pastor here at Village Point Church. Welcome to our Easter service. Happy Easter to you. What a beautiful day to celebrate the risen King. Thanks for coming and for joining us this morning. If you are visiting us for the first time, I'd love to invite you to stop at our welcome center just right outside of our worship center here. And there's a little gift we have for you and you can get some more information about our church as well. And I just want to say that you have been prayed for for weeks. We have uh, several uh, times of prayer during the week that uh, we're praying for, for, for our people. We're praying for those who God wants to bring. And, and, and I personally have been praying for you as well. And I, and I do believe that you're not here by chance. I, I really, I truly believe that God in his, in his sovereignty, God in, in, in his providential leading and control over your life, he has brought you here today. And, and I am certain that that his word, not mine, but God's word, has the power to transform your life forever. Amen. The word of God has the power to shape and to mold and to refine and to transform us into the likeness of Christ. So I invite you, and I, and I pray that you will, turn your hearts and your ears to God and and, and to be attentive to his voice this morning. Last week, we looked at Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, riding on a donkey. And we said that the, triumphant, the triumphal entry is only triumphant when we consider what Jesus was about to accomplish on the cross. He was welcomed as king as he processed into Jerusalem, but he knew the cross awaited him. Oh, two days ago, just here, we celebrated, we, we gathered together at our Good Friday service, and we, we paused to reflect on, on Jesus' death on the cross. We, we considered the sacrifice that he made by shedding his blood and, and by giving up his life in exchange for our redemption, for our freedom. He paid the penalty we deserved in exchange for our freedom. You see, the ultimate display of God's pursuit of man, the ultimate display of God's grace and love towards us was Jesus' redemptive work on the cross. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I am found. I was blind, but now I see. But the cross isn't the end of the story because after three days, Jesus triumphantly defeated death. And that's why we're here this morning. And that's what Easter is all about. It's, it's the celebration of the hope and the life and the redemption that we have in Jesus. Jesus conquered death and so will those who place their faith in him. Andre uh, read it earlier this morning, John eleven fifteen. 15. I am the resurrection of and the life. The resurrection and the life. And he who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. So I want us to read the resurrection story this morning. But I want you to, to follow along on the screens behind me. I want you to, to just try to put yourself in the, in the picture, to, to imagine being there at that encounter, okay? Just try to read it. Maybe you've read it many times before, but, but, but what, would we, what would we look like? What would, we, what would you feel if you were there? And heard that the tomb was empty and Jesus was alive. So Matthew 28, you can follow in your Bible, starting on verse 1, and you can follow here behind me as well. It says, this, Now, after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. Remember, they had just, that was Friday, Jesus crucified. This is, Saturday had passed. This is, this is the, the, the morning, Sunday morning. They're going to see the tomb. And they had lost their hope. They thought their Messiah was crucified and all our hopes, all their hopes were on that cross dead with him. And behold, there was an earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
And his appearance was, was like, like lightning, and, and his clothing was white as snow. And, and for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. They had no idea what was going on. They pretended they were dead. But the angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know what you seek. I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. And then he says, he is not here, for he has risen, and he's, as he said. And he says, come and see the place where he lay. Then, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. And I want to pause here for just a moment. Can you picture the scene? You know, Mary Magdalene get into the tomb, and, and she says to the other Mary, uh, she hears what the angel says, and she says, do you want to look first? Uh, do you want to go in? And Have you considered, have you ever wondered, did they rush into the tomb, or they just, they just maybe just poked their heads in, and uh, is he not here? What is going on, right? Were they looking around to f- try to find him? Like my daughter... Sarah did yesterday at our Easter egg hunt. There, was, uh, there were stations set up throughout our gym telling the gospel story. And, and there was walking kids through the creation, the fall, and the redemption. And the empty tomb station was especially fascinating to my two-year-old daughter, Sarah. She used a flashlight to try to find Jesus. Yeah. In the tomb. And she couldn't find him. So she ran to me and she said, Jesus is not there. And then she says, isn't that awesome? <laughs> and then this morning I tried to, okay, maybe let me, see, let me see if she remembers. I said, remember, Sarah, you're looking for Jesus and he, he was not there. She says, that's good news, right? <laughs> I mean, I can only imagine, I can only imagine the excitement the two Marys must have felt. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy, and they ran to tell his disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings. And they came up and and took hold of his feet and, and worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. Isn't that an amazing story? Doesn't that bring Easter to life again? He is risen. risen. He is not in a tomb. And they, the the, the two women and the disciples, they were followers of Jesus. They They were excited about it. They were thrilled with the news. But I tell you, there were those who were anything but thrilled. If you continue to read the story in verses 11 through 15, the the chief priests heard the tomb was empty. And they they put together a plan. And they gave the soldiers a, a, a large sum of money telling them to say that the disciples had come in the middle of the night while they were asleep. And they had stolen the body of Jesus. The chief priests did not know what to do with the news that they had just received. You know, they they knew they were familiar with death, but not resurrection. They, they, and the world, in the same way, the world doesn't have a problem with Jesus' life, with, with his humanity, that he came and he lived among us. They don't have a problem believing a historical person. That was an insightful teacher whose moral example was worth following. They don't have a problem uh, even saying, declaring that he, he is the pinnacle of love and, and he was a humble servant who helped others in need. Living and dying is not a problem because we all understand what, what it means to die, don't we? We read it on the news. We, we watch it on TV. We lose loved ones Though we are not ever ready for it, we recognize that we will all face it one day. The disciples, the follower of Jesus, also witnessed his life and his death. But you see, the problem lies in whether or not Jesus was risen from the dead. 
And years go by and decades and generations come and go, but believing in the physical resurrection of Jesus is still a big deal for many people. I don't know about you, perhaps you've never considered the reliability of the resurrection. Maybe you grew up in church, maybe you never really paused to consider that question. But I, but I want to ask you this morning, what if Jesus hadn't been raised from the dead? What would be different in our world today if he was still in a tomb? What would be different in your life if he had not been risen from the dead? In other words, what difference does the resurrection make? And let me tell you, the what if concerning Jesus' resurrection goes back 2,000 years. In fact, Paul wrote a letter to the Corinthian church addressing that very issue. And I want us to turn into 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to read verses 12 through 20. And we will consider the difference the resurrection makes. Once again, you can follow along on the screens behind me here. 1 Corinthians 15, starting on verse 12, says this. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead... How can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of dead, the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he had raised Christ. Whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. And you are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. What difference does the resurrection make? First, the resurrection validates our preaching. The resurrection validates our preaching. Verse 13, but if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is in vain. Paul is saying if there's no resurrection, both our faith and our preaching is meaningless. In other words, our self-denying, our self-sacrifice, our fervent prayers, our Bible studies, our discipleship programs, every worship service you've been a part of, and the songs, and the skits, and the baptisms, and, and the sermons, and your time commitment, your financial investments, the outreach efforts, the evangelistic campaigns, and the various mission trips that you went to, and the assistance you gave to the poor, if Christ did not raise raised from the dead, all of these things are useless. All your effort was worth nothing. It was a waste of time. Later on in verse 32, Paul says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we'll, we'll die. It's like, you know, if, if there's no resurrection, what are we doing? Let's just do life and live recklessly. Preaching a Messiah who is still dead is meaningless. Secondly, the resurrection validates our gospel witnessing. Look at verse 14. And if Christ has not been raised, we are even found to be misrepresenting God. Because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. Another version says it this way. If there is no resurrection... We would be guilty of telling a string of barefaced lies about God. All these affidavits, all these affirmations we passed on to you, verifying that God raised up Christ, they're sheer fabrications. There's no resurrection. Those professing faith in Christ would be mocked. Like a pastor in South Africa who recently faked the resurrection of a family member from someone in his church. 
And sadly, after the video went viral on social media, he was sued by the funeral homes and he was found guilty of, of prearranging the whole scam with the family and, and manipulate, manipulating the funeral homes into being involved. And, and as a result, he was ridiculed and, and condemned by many. You know, Paul says, if there's no resurrection, we will be found to be false witnesses of God. People would be mocking us. There's no resurrection. Both our faith and our preaching would be meaningless. And we would be guilty of telling lies about God. Thirdly, if there's no resurrection, or the resurrection then validates our faith in God. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. If there's no resurrection, our faith is empty. In other words, it doesn't make sense to believe in a Christ if he hasn't been raised from the dead. If there's no resurrection, our faith is of no value. Why? Because it does not lead anywhere, right? It promises something that cannot be fulfilled. So if that's the case, you can stop praying. You can quit believing because no results can come out of an empty faith. There's no resurrection. There's no certainty of the forgiveness of sin. So we're all here, and all the promises we've heard, they're all lies and false. In fact, Paul says that if there's no resurrection, we're still in our sins. We're still trapped, and Jesus' payment wasn't enough. And if the payment he paid wasn't enough, then what can we do? We're toast. <laughs> That's the case. We will still be defeated by death. During that long weekend in Jerusalem, no one had the assurance that Jesus' death had been enough. And if Jesus remained in the tomb, it would mean that Satan had won the battle and Jesus had been defeated. But the resurrection is the proof. The resurrection is the guarantee. It validates our faith. It's the guarantee that all your sins and all of my sins have been paid for. And praise Jesus for that. 1 Peter 2.24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds we have been healed. Because of Jesus' death and resurrection, our sins are not only paid for, but we are set free from the bondage of sin. Sin no longer has a hold on us. Lastly, the resurrection validates our hope for eternity. The resurrection validates our hope for eternity. If in Christ we have hope and this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. If there is no resurrection, my friends, serving God is worthless. Paul says that if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, if our faith has no grounding, we are deceiving ourselves. Again, if there's no resurrection, the message of salvation can no longer be proclaimed and our eternal destiny is compromised. We might as well seize our worship gatherings and live recklessly. If Jesus is still in the tomb, Paul says that we are of all people most to be pitied. People would feel sorry for us. Sorry about because we've believed a lie, and not only we deceived ourselves, we, we have deceived others as well. However, Paul continues, and he continues to address that question, and he says in verse 20, but in fact, let's read together, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He has been raised from the dead. Jesus Christ defeated death and he reigns forever. 
He defeated death and he reigns forever. Earlier in the chapter, Paul goes on to say that the risen Christ was seen by more than 500 people. Then in Acts 1, 3, he says that, that Jesus presented himself alive after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. How much more proof does one need to believe the reliability of the resurrection, right? Lee Strobel, I think his comment on, on this issue is priceless. He says, he says, I went to a psychologist friend and said, if, if 500 people claimed to see Jesus after he died, is it possible it was just a hallucination? And, and, and his friend, his psychologist friend says, he says, uh, uh, hallucinations are an individual event. In other words, if 500 people have, have the same hallucination, that's bigger miracle than the resurrection. <laughs> and by the way, I'm excited to invite you to our new sermon series is starting next week called 40 Days with Jesus, where we'll be spending six weeks at, uh, looking at, at Jesus' encounters, several of Jesus' life-changing encounters with people between his resurrection and his ascension. So you're welcome to come back and join us for that. What, re what difference does the resurrection make? What difference does it make? It matters greatly because it is the proof that Jesus is who he claimed to be. He is the son of the living God. He has power over life and death. The empty tomb, my friends, is the assurance that death will be swallowed up once and for all. And we will never again walk in the shadow of death. In Jesus, though death is temporary, it has no hold on us. The empty tomb is the guarantee that one day those who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, they will also be raised from the dead and they will live forever under his rule and reign. Amen. Hallelujah. A.W. Tozer puts it like this. Let us be confident. Christian brethren, that our power does not lay in a manger at Bethlehem, nor in the relics of the cross. He says, true spiritual power resides in the victory of the mighty resurrected Lord of glory. The power of the Christian believer lies in the Savior's triumph of eternal glory. Listen to this. Christ's resurrection brought about a startling change of direction for the believers. Here's how it was. Sadness and fear and mourning marked the direction of their religion before they knew that Jesus was raised from the dead. Their direction was toward the grave. Everything is over. We lost. But when they heard the angelic witness say, he is risen, as he said. The direction immediately shifted away from the tomb. Yeah. And it's focused on a Christ who is alive. And he offers us life as well. The resurrection makes all the difference in the world. The resurrection of Jesus turned Mary's tears into joy. It replaced the disciples' fear with boldness. It launched an unstoppable movement to take the good news of the gospel throughout Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and, and to the ends of the earth. Because of the resurrection, our sins are forgiven, our lives are restored, our hope is renewed, and our eternity is guaranteed. Yes. Hallelujah. Jesus took our sins, he took our past, he took our failures, and he took our pain with him on the cross. He was our substitute. He died in our place, but he bridged the chasm of sin that separated us from God. He suffered for something that he didn't deserve so that we could have access to something we've never earned on our own. 
He triumphantly defeated death, and it is only by trusting him as Lord and Savior that we can be made right with God. The resurrection of Jesus changes everything. It changes everything. It gives us hope. It gives us joy. Even when things are hard, we can trust in a God who gives us life. And he gives us the, the boldness and, and he strengthens us to go through difficult times and good times. It sets our priorities. It, it enhances our faith. It causes us to live on mission for him. God rescued us in Christ and he gave us a new identity. We're sons and daughters of, of God. He blessed us with every spiritual blessing and he saved us from his wrath and, and to himself. He, he lavished us with grace and he loved us unconditionally. Listen, in Jesus, our destiny is secured. He is the door to our eternal home because our time here... Whether you love it or not, it's temporary. He's prepared a place to all who put their, their trust in him. The good news of the gospel, the resurrection of Christ, guarantees our eternal destiny. Let me close with this. If you are a Christ follower, I pray that you will continue, and maybe for some of you, that you will begin to live your life in light of the truth of the resurrection. If you have already placed your faith in Jesus, do you live in light of the truth that he is alive? Does your life reflect a Christ who is alive? Who gives us life and joy and peace. And he sends us out. To put him on display. You know, the resurrection validates your preaching. For follower of Christ, the, res the resurrection validates your preaching. So keep on preaching boldly. There are many who are yet to be introduced to Christ. And you have the privilege and the opportunity to do that. Maybe you don't have a, a platform. But God is giving you so many opportunities with your friends and, and your family members and people that you work with that you can introduce them to Christ. Keep on preaching boldly. There's so many that need to hear that Christ can transform their lives as he has transformed yours. The resurrection validates your gospel witnessing, so keep on witnessing. Be intentional about living out the gospel and pointing others to Christ anywhere you can and, and any way you can. You've been tasked with a mission to spread the good news of Jesus throughout the world. The resurrection validates your faith in God, so keep on trusting him unreservedly. Trust him with your present and with your future. Trust him in good times and in bad times. Above all, trust his sovereignty, his goodness, and his unfailing love, and his amazing grace, and his never-ending faithfulness. Trust him. And lastly, the resurrection validates your hope for eternity. So be kingdom-minded. Focus on what's eternal. Don't fix your eyes on things that are here because these are all going to vanish. Set your mind not on what you can gain for this life because the real prize is in living your life to build for the eternal kingdom. Be kingdom minded. Now perhaps there are some in this room today that, that needs to make a commitment to follow Christ to pledge allegiance to him, to surrender your life to the lordship of Jesus Christ and to trust him unreservedly. Maybe you are in that place where you're saying, you know what, enough of just trying to do it on my own. I want to surrender my life. I want to give up my life and live for him. You can make that decision today. 
Bible teaches us that if you confess with your mouth, it's a confession with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And if you believe in your heart that God indeed raised Jesus from the dead, if you believe the resurrection that we just talked about, that we're celebrating today, then you will be saved. Then you get to experience new life in Christ as well. Then he sets a different priority for you. Then, then, then you start looking at what is it that God has, has called you, where he's placed you, that, that you want to live for him and tell others about him as well. For with the heart, one believes and is justified, and with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. You can make that decision today. God's free gift of salvation is received by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Let me tell you, nothing needs to be added. There's no extra sacrifice. There's no more payment that needs to be made because Christ already did it. He already paid for it. For yours and for mine. Nothing else needs to be added. It's grace alone. It's unmerited favor alone. And you receive it through placing your faith in Jesus Christ alone. He's the only one who can give you life. Everlasting life. The sure hope of eternal life. The exceeding peace that Christ gives. And the abiding joy of knowing that you have been made right with God. Only comes to those who have surrendered their life. And open their heart to receive God's gift of the Savior. Now, now, how do we respond to the free gift of salvation? You see, the gift is free. He offers it. It is yours. But you have to receive it. You have to receive it in order to be yours. The choice is yours. You can either accept it. God's free gift of salvation. You can reject it. And spend eternity without him. Separated from him. I want to pray for us. Would you stand with me? If you want to do that this morning. I would love to pray with you at the end. And, and, and guide you. And, and, and talk you through what's next. How do you begin this life with Jesus Christ? And take this opportunity as an amazing opportunity God is giving you today. For those of you who have already done it, may you leave this place really believing, but not just saying, yeah, he did raise from the dead, but embracing that truth, putting all your trust in him, and being as excited as my daughter was to tell everyone that the tomb is empty. That you cannot find Jesus anywhere because he is alive. And isn't that awesome? Isn't that good news? Yes, it is. So tell everyone about it. Father, we are so thankful and grateful for being here in this room this morning. I, I am thankful for your word that shapes and refines us. And God, I simply ask, would you help us? Would you help us be witnesses for you? Not only in this place, but when we leave this place. That's when our mission field begins. I pray that you will equip us. That you will give us the desire, the passion, the boldness to speak of your goodness, of your grace. God, may we be excited about the resurrection. Excited to go tell others about it. And God, for those who need you, need to make that commitment. Holy Spirit, I pray that you will do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.